that by getting a group of people together at the same time, you do the net the networking thing happens, mm. which has got a massive value. Mm -hmm. And that's going back to me being a brown noser. I was like, who you know is really important. Mm. Um, and and if you want to get to know someone, it's good to be of service to them. That's so I think um, that's something that I also encouraged in people was to be of service to people. Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official .com. You need the Television app. 24 7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. This is going to be a treat. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London or central as you need to be, the sport and art, street culture, music, and we know what it is. It's the Killer Keller Podcast. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Everyone who's got the television app free, download for your sports. Uh, we have a gentleman inside the place. Legacy holding is an understatement. A uh, very informative early 80s, uh, maybe even sooner, if we shall find out. Videographer, photographer, ID, face, Buffalo movement, Judy Black. I mean, like, I'm wearing the regalia to prove it. The mighty Mark LeBon inside the house. How are you, sir? I'm well. How, how it happened, mum met dad and they had a shag and that's how it happened. <laughs> that's how I am. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to have you on here, sir. It's good to be here. How Thanks have you been? Thanks for having me. I've been all right. Um, still learning. Still learning. Which is good. I think it's all about being educated and entertained. Mm. Make them laugh, make them cry, mm. and learn something along the way if you're really lucky. Mm. A gentleman. And actually, the first podcast you've done. It is indeed, yeah. Talk about learning. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea, and you certainly, are. I don't know what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. <laughs> Local to the area. Local to the area, yeah. Always been around uh, Northwest. Um, I've done a bit of North, and I used to s go to Brick Lane as a kid regularly. And I, I was lacking on the South, but my boys are South, so I'm doing. I'm catching up with South mm. now. How many kids you got? I got two. They're ten years apart. Ten years apart, eh? Thirty-ish and forty-ish. Oh, wow. Coming up to, mm. yeah. Both a lot better at doing what I do. You're a man that said on uh, online, which of course I, I, I did check. I've checked many years ago. Actually, to be fair, that you, you're 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 very uh, uh, you're resilient and and you, and you 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 love working. And it's hard to uh, put uh, put the uh, uh, utilities down, and you constantly want to create and constantly want to uh, be a part of projects and and do things. God, no, I don't, I don't know where you got that from. Vince <laughs> <laughs> being here. <laughs> um, you I, love it, though. You love the art. Um, I, I like art with a small A. I've never liked um, art with a big A. I'm much more into commercial art. I think it's a lot more honest than art with a big A. Um, Elaborate. Why, why is that? Well, you're doing something for a reason rather than for a higher calling. You're doing it for to represent someone else's uh, message or feelings um, for money. Mm. Whereas higher art talks about all kinds of fucking bullshit and lies out its ass and it's all about money in the end. Mm. And it, and it, but it... It, it pretends to have a higher calling. Mm. Is that ego? That's an ego trip on the... Oh, I yeah, so. whatever ego means, it probably is that, mm. yeah. Um, you know, and it all came from kings and queens and yeah. religion and controlling people. So, mm. yeah, I don't like art with a capital A. I, I, I think I was frightened of failing at it as well. Um, Does that G you up? That that has to G you up. If you if there's a back of the mind, or what if? What if? It's kind of a good incentive, isn't it? What if? What if it goes wrong? <laughs> yeah. What if it goes wrong? Yeah. 
Well, you know, yeah, that's 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 a, a problem. But um, what if it doesn't go wrong? That's a problem. Can because then it's really fucking boring. <laughs> only when it go, go. Only, only when it sort of goes wrong are there lessons to be learned. That's an interesting theory. So, yeah, because it's true, isn't it? If it if, all goes right, what the fuck have you gained from it? Yeah. So anyway, I've tried to make that part of my uh, signature style. Um, yeah. The signature style of? My, my work, um, embracing things going wrong mm. um, and stuff like that. I like that. I like yeah. that. A lot of people think too much about the success, the, 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 the one in five, the, the numbers you can count on your hand of, of the, the people you think of that have done it right, when a lot of times the mistakes are part of the process and actually you can relay of thousands of you know, examples of where it's gone wrong yeah. and then out of the deck of cards falling comes this awesome. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to make mistakes for other people. They can get it right. I'm quite happy to get it wrong. And, um, you know, I'm much more excited by getting it wrong. I don't learn anything getting it right. Mm. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very blessed to have been able to get away with it. <laughs> well, at the same time, you, you've, you, you're a conduit to the, the, the subject when it comes to video making and photography and I mean obviously you assemble these mass productions and or you can go really intimate and take the one-off shots and the um, experimental uh, projects but a lot of times you, you you're you able to see it probably before you know what I mean creating those production pieces you're able to see it in advance and and you're a conduit to it well um, I've always tried I, I've tried to be a conduit for other people to um as well which has been a bit of a distraction really i spent a lot of my uh, career um promoting other people in as far as that's what commercial art does but also from a production point of view i've actually supported people who've wanted to be involved in their careers as filmmakers or photographers i've actually gone out of my way to sort of uh, support that process of helping other people and eventually um, I wasn't very good at it commercially but um, when um, when I sort of uh, started giving up with the high the idea of being a commercial success and was blessed with the responsibilities of being a single parent I landed up teaching and that formalised my um, my desire to sort of support other people's. Well, I don't know what was the word that you just used Could that got me riffing. Being a conduit, yeah. yeah, for other people's, a bit, you know, for other people to express themselves. Mm. So yeah, it's so you know, I I, was, I taught for twelve years, so. Oh, probably it, what university? Yeah, yeah, whereabouts? Yeah, at um, the London College yeah, of Fashion. Yes. So, um, yeah, it found me in the end and it, and it formalised the relationship and it was very odd having a proper job for a bit. <laughs> yeah, I heard about those things. I heard they pay regular, shit like that. <laughs> very weird. <laughs> yeah, very odd. I can imagine you as a teacher, you know. Uh, you've got that quite... I've I got a feeling, like, you, you could be the very, very much the, the, the forthright decision-maker... The, the 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 leader of a boardroom. I can imagine that you, as a teacher, would be pretty darn good. I think I was pretty threatening to the establishment, and I think a lot of my students were very threatened by me. You know, when I told them, I mean, the whole establishment was interested in them getting things right. When I told them that I wasn't interested in anyone getting anything right, I was only interested in people getting things wrong. Mm. I both shocked the students and the establishment <laughs> as well. <laughs> so it was amazing that I actually lasted there as long as I did. That's a lot of time, especially, mm. you know, dealing with those kind of Chinese burns. <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm. It's got to hurt them a little bit. Mm. Uh, don't want an establishment. I think the last time, or more so the, the more recent time, that uh, 
I was, you know, fortunate enough to be in the company of you, your family, and and the, and mm. the, the majority of the establishment was. I think it was at your place. At the, you mentioned it was probably the Stussy get together yeah. with, with Goldie and yeah. who else was in there? Big up Dave Baby, of course. Dave Baby in the house. Um, there was a lot. There was a lot of people. There, there were some starry people there. Yeah, man. I might as well have had my hand out ready to take yeah. on every corner because it just seemed to me like you. And you were such a good host. So it was just it's, it's bonkers, and just down the road as well. Um, it bonkers to see all these people in one place and the command at that. Yeah, has. I've always been starstruck. I must say, I'm a total brown nose, a freak. <laughs> um, I, I I I always taught at college that. Um, uh, also, this is another reason why the students hated me. On a on a photographic film course, I told them their most important tool was the Excel sheet, which is everyone's total nightmare of for, of of any you know when you're as a kid and you're introduced to the computer. Apparently, yeah. that's one thing that you're introduced to. But yeah. for me, the Excel sheet is an address book is run off Excel. Your accounting is run off Excel, uh, and your calendar, your time is run off Excel. Sad but true. So the people that you know, the time that you spend, and what what that what 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 it's worth are all really important things, and they're all organised in the Excel program. Mm. So get good at Excel, and you'll be a success. Mm, yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know how I got onto that. Well, mathematics and whatnot. I mean, it's <laughs> not everybody's first uh, Excel sheets, and you know, it's not everyone's first creative. Well, people dis- don't think that it's a creative thing, but actually. Oh, I know. I was, I was. I got there from the parties because, mm. you know, to be able to get one's address book and to get people together in in um, in time at a particular time at a place, which is the address book at mm. a time, which is the calendar, and um, the I knee suppose bones connected to the leg yeah. bone. That, yeah, <laughs> and I, I, as far as the money. As far as the worth is concerned, um, what happens is is that by getting a group of people together at the same time, you do the net the networking thing happens, mm. which has got a massive value, mm. and that's going back to me being a brown noser. It was like who you know is really important, mm. um, and and if you want to get to know someone. It's good to be of service to them. So I think um, that's something that I also encouraged in people was to be of service to people. Um, And so, uh, yeah, that's what those parties were all about. That's such an interesting point of view. Be of service to someone. Yeah, getting those kind of people in a room... When there used to be scenes back in the day. I mean, yeah. there's hardly any scenes anymore. But they, that, those were the, the usual kind of places where people would congregate. I, I guess you got. No, I think of... that's you getting old that there aren't any <laughs> scenes anymore. No, I'm blaming COVID on everything here. <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 yeah, I guess youthful wisdom. It, it, if there was a record store, I would be down there in a heartbeat. If there was a, you know, if someone was opening an envelope, I'd be down there, you know. I. Those things, I guess, as you get older, they need to be kind of orchestrated, don't they? Yeah, well, you know, there are there are record stores. You know, they're just different. They're on Instagram. Mm. They're just they're just different, and they're still there. I mean, they're there more than ever. I mean, that's what's a bit odd about it all is that they're so there. It's, it's congested. It's, it's there. It's congested. Yeah, one doesn't know where to start. It's mm. So. So all over the place. So um, it's true, isn't it? It's all about. I think it's about filtering information these days, and um, and also, which is quite fascinating, is that we're in the information age rather than the communication age now. Mm. So it's about filtration, and also that when you look at any system that sort of is information fed um you've got to uh for 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 it to be real then you need to work a loop of uncertainty as a very positive aspect to 
the way that you approach problem solving. Loop of uncertainty, what's, how, define well, what's that? Well, it's just that you've got, in, in a real situation where there's a whole load of information, mm. it, it's recognising what's uncertain about it. Mm. it. It's not about it being right and finite and simple. Safe. And, yeah, they might think safe. But in actual fact, if you're under the illusion that it is finite and simple and without uncertainty, you're actually very unsafe because uncertainty is actually always there. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest lesson of like the last three years is that dealing with uncertainty is a really important aspect of life. And mm. it actually will enable real solutions and they're not simple straightforward right and wrong mm. they actually have got to include uncertainty for them to be a real reflection of what's going on mm. and i think once one embraces that in, instead of trying to fight it and have security in certainty you need to find security in uncertainty mm. do you think artists go that extra distance to put themselves really close to the fire with uh, maybe overly ambitious ideas or or going with their creative head and going too far where that uncertainty it, it's, it's almost like they've gone down a rabbit hole and going back to the spreadsheets and the you know and and the, the number crunching they don't they they can't even grasp and and they get taken away by the creative their crea own creative desires well, I don't know. I think successful artists, success in an inverted, in inverted commas, God forbid that I should ever be a successful one. I mean, I don't mind being a successful commercial artist, but being a successful artist with a capital A, I think they, they're so committed to their oeuvre of ways of seeing something that they, that, they, that they put out a sense of certainty about their vision and who they are. Mm. And it's got to be handed to them that it does give you a sense of security when people are that committed and that focused mm. and that shut down <laughs> yeah. on their vision <laughs> yeah. that they get really fucking good at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. They, you know, if they become it, that, yeah, it's it, it's it's very it's very recognisable. It's very tangible, and it gives one a, a great sense of security. Mm. But um, most of them are completely fucked. I mean, not that I'm not completely... Well, I'm not completely fucked. And actually, saying that they're completely fucked is probably a bit of... Um, what's the word? Um, Pessimism? Hi uh, hyperbolic. hyperbolic. A hyper... Hyperbole. Hyperbolics <laughs> is what I call it. It's when you talk about things in extremes... Um, I've got to watch out for doing that, but they're not completely <laughs> fucked. But they're quite seriously fucked to be able to get that concentrated about what they're doing. Mm. And it does offer a sense of security. How real that is, I think it's definitely questionable. Mm. But, it, but it does inspire confidence when people commit themselves um, to, to a vision it, as, as, you know, in a very intense way. It's, there's something... Mm. There's something safe, the way he feels safe with it. I remember that guy, I think his name was Darrison on Pop Idol back in like the early noughties. Do you remember him? He he did this Hit Me Baby one more time. But he, he got shut down. He had the level of confidence on the audition. I remember it so well, I wasn't young. But he, he, he genuinely believed he was a superstar. He got shut down and thrown to the curb. And then the next thing... An independent label got him, and then he got signed to a major, and then he got a number one. And and I guess that's the kind of thing. It's like there is an absolute unthinkable level of um, self belief, almost like people would think you're nuts. But yeah. then look who the look who's laughing now. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. You've got to. Yeah. No matter what kind of self identification yeah. crisis you think you got, you got to do it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. 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 And uh, you know, for. In the end, I think I've sort of stuck by my um, being an out of control freak in in a sort of in over a long enough period of time for me to have gained some respect for it in in, in the business. So, do you, you reckon know, the more the more out out the more extreme you can kind of go, that actually in return the more kudos you get for your 
the pioneering efforts, the success rate, the things that could have gone wrong at any point, they become your acclaim. Yeah, really. I think um, commitment, I mean, extreme is probably quite a good word to describe, you know, very intense, committed way of, of uh, creating. You know, I think, I think... I think it does pay off and I think people or certainly in my case the I've been able to um, achieve that sense of intensity by actually slowing down and also um, not over controlling things because um, as I said before with me control always used to go very wrong. So it's about sort of controlling something until it starts to go wrong for me and feels uncomfortable and then moving away and starting again. Is that hard to do? Well, I think what I've got to accept is I think I've got attention deficit disorder. So that's why it isn't hard for me to actually <laughs> let go of something and disappear from it. He'll be jumping a, on his phone in a minute, Roll kids. another joint, have a bag, <laughs> shove something in my mouth, eat something, <laughs> do anything but what I'm supposed to be doing. And um, I, uh, I, the, the, the more I can let go and then start again, the, the more I can commit to something. But it needs to be committal and then letting go and then recommitting and then letting go and recommitting. Because it just doesn't work for me just hitting my head against... I just land up hitting my head against a brick wall and it hurts. And um, in the old days, I used to take lots of drugs to sort of ease the pain, but I don't do that anymore. I just let go of whatever feels shitty and start again. Go, get back to it. Go mm. a little fresh. And um, and that seems to be working. And I seem to... It's like making attention deficit disorder work, work for me. Mm. It's about having five different things on the go and going from one to the other. And I guess when you're working in a project, that work chain it actually benefits because you can pass on the project to the next person without too much thought. It's probably good for your health, <laughs> letting things move on to, like, I don't know, the editor or yeah. the, the post-production. Yeah. Or the, you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I, mean, I think getting other people involved has got its own problems. But I think just you don't even have to let go of them to someone else. You just need to just move away or I need to just move away from them and um, and come back. I think having people as a bouncing board, as a way of discovering what I'm actually thinking and what I'm actually feeling mm. is hugely important mm. to me. And also what just from my personal point of view, sometimes when you're managing a team or you've got someone that you've got passing or next to, you actually learn a lot about how you convey an idea to what their interpretation of it is. Are you really as expressive in what you're thinking as you think you are? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know I mean? It's very good. It's very good to know. You know, if, if we're in the business of communicating with other people, it's very useful to know how <laughs> yeah. that's actually going yeah, that sort of thing in the age of communication who thought you'd actually have to communicate <laughs> yeah i mean we ought to be really good we, we should have been we should really have moved on from the communication age but of course it takes a long time i mean i still don't think we're fully aware of what the industrial revolution's done to us mm. or you know maybe what iron age meant as opposed to the bronze age you know, it ta I think it, it takes a lot, a lot of uh, reflection and a lot of time to actually really see or understand where we are. Information, communication is power, isn't it? Because of the, 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 the power in words and the power in the way they're conveyed. You, you've certainly, you forged your career on information and a level of communication, communicating messages. Yeah, well, I've sort of ruined my career by not fully appreciating the information age, but I certainly um, embraced the, you know, the the, the 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 peak of the communication age. I, I feel like I've I've lived I've lived through that with the coming of the mobile phone and mm -hmm. and computers. You know, I've I I, I, I know life before computers and mobile phones. BC, innit? And, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, 
uh, it was it was still pretty amazing video arriving and Polaroid film arriving mm. and certain things, tools that I used before computers and mobile phones and um, and and knowing also because when I was at college I actually studied communication design and to sort of look back at communication as an era it was important to understand what the new era was that we were moving into which mm. was the information age and um and so yeah it's um i think the information age is actually what the new generation are actually sort of stuck with mm. communication's really gone as far as it can go and then the big problems now is is just what people do with information and of course misinformation and mm. Yeah. The complexity of the information age is something above and beyond what we've had to experience. And sometimes you've got to put your hands up and say, hey, I'm not part of it. Sorry, guys, I'm going to leave you to it because it's a lot, isn't it? It's it a is lot. a lot, yeah. I mean, I, what, what used uh, for an example is that um, the videotapes from my production company experiences i ran a production company on and off over 15 years mm -hmm. and the tapes that i created for that production company in that time took up the space of this room here which is 15 by 15 mm. by 15 or something isn't well it? yeah something yeah like that. something like that um you know that all of that room is now contained on on a fingernail yeah Mind blowing, isn't it? That yeah, yeah, that's happened in my lifetime. Yeah, and um, that's an example of of you know the communication age, the information. So and now you know suddenly we're worried about the heat that all of this information yeah. is creating, yeah. and that it's not at all green and stuff like that. And um, there's just so much of that stuff out there. It's fucking unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. So yeah. Um, <laughs> Just going back to that, uh, you know, the fingernail yeah. analogy there. How does that make you feel? Because uh, because actually what you just said there is really poignant in that mm. you, you were part of such a big creative push forward in fashion and music and the arts. And the processes in making all of these things visible, you had your way about making them the way mm. they are some secrets in the recipe kind of yeah thing. now there's no secrets now it's like you say it's all condensed into one small thing and and although there is a lot of creativity in the world where all these new advancements are concerned it must how does it make you feel that 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 process old process has now been kind of awash with what <laughs> where it's been put now well it's it's all about uh, it's quite quite interesting because maybe it's quite a, 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 a you've got to come at it from quite a spiritual uh, approach maybe is I, as I said uh, it needs filtration it's all in how you filter your life seeing there's so much of this information around mm. so a sense of purpose I've found that with some young people that I associate with now if if you have a sense of purpose then you 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 narrow down you know what it is that mm. you're interested in mm. and um and that makes it manageable it's all about things being manageable i think and um and i think that's absolutely essential to sort of have a sense of purpose these days and mm. a mission brief yeah because then, then you can find your way through the the forest yeah. of, of information. Because you look, you you know what you're looking for. Um, You've had many mission briefs, haven't you? Well, I've actually, I, I've 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 only recently, as far as I'm concerned, come up with a mission. Um, I've always felt very blessed. I come from a middle class background. I was tall. I had 
you know, good sight and vision. I was the favourite out of my brothers and sisters by by a long shot. My picked mother, it up, always my, picked it up. My, my, my mother was not very nice to my brother or sister. So I had... I was always felt like I had an abundance of love in my life. So I felt very blessed and I felt a bit awkward about wanting anything because I felt so blessed with what I had. Mm. So the whole thing of having a mission statement and wanting something aside from what I had felt a bit greedy. Mm. But I've realised that even though in life our desires bring a fair amount of pain with them, it is important to actually be desirous of something and that pain and 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 the desire for something that one hasn't got is actually a very important aspect of being human. Hmm. And so recently I've um I realized that I I I I had the for, the, the good fortune of seeing the Dalai Lama Wow. About 20 years ago when he came to London and he gave four days lectures on the noble truth and, and then he gave out this prayer at the end of uh, these four day of lect lectures. And um, the last bit of the prayer is something uh, like, um, with, the wish to, uh, with the wish to free all centuries, uh, 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 as long as space endures and as long as sentient beings remain, May I to abide to dispel the miseries of the world. And if I can do anything, you know, that's become my mission now, oh. is to dispel the miseries of the world. And, you know, a, a certain amount of pain is inevitable. Mm. But misery is something that we've got an option about. Yeah. And if we get the right thinking and the right purpose and the right intention behind what we do, if we're sort of right about everything suddenly the misery disappears. Mm. It's like an optional thing. Pain isn't particularly optional, but misery is something that we bring into, or I've brought into my life, mm. where I haven't even really needed to. It's just, it's just an add-on to an emotional... Yeah, I know what you mean. You know, it's just yeah. fucking bollocks. Yeah. Anyway, that's... You know, I've spent most of my life in that fucking bollocks. And it's, it's not necessary... And so if I can help people come out of misery, I think that would be, that'd be a fine thing. So I don't really know how I'm going to go about doing that yet, but it's nice to actually have a mission and to have a focus in my life. And I suppose one of the things that I'm working on at the moment is processing all of this information that I've created in my archive and actually making it manageable so that it can so that it can sort of serve a purpose. How it's actually going to remove people's misery, I'm not quite <laughs> sure yet. But I think leaving it as a, as a mess, mm. which is what it was, and what it could possibly be if I don't do the work on it. It's could passing I, your misery on to someone else. It's my misery on to someone else. Exactly. Do, you th do you think a lot of what you're talking about here, um, this, this below-the-line, misty, you know, hard-to-pull-yourself-away-from-misery... Yeah. Because there is a there's an energy to that, and a lot of which probably helped fuel in the creativity that you you had within your projects and whether it shoots or yeah, you know, it, it no. also is an aid, isn't it? Oh, it's certainly for me the closest that I've got to um, art with with a sort of capital A, uh, not being commercial, is as a therapeutic as a therapeutic tool. Mm. So. Um, my misery, certainly since right. I stopped taking drugs and actually got in touch with a bit more of my misery, because <laughs> drugs were great at dealing with that yeah. in a way. They only put off the inevitable. Um, but as I started to face, without drugs, to, to, to face that misery, it was through um, that sort of cathartic working with that, with that misery that actually makes up the body of what will be my one of my strands to my archive which is this art strand mm. i don't know quite i don't know quite how you know the best the best it's not a capital a and it's not a small a as in commercial art but it's closest to the i suppose it's a it's an anarchic art yeah. it's, it's an anarchic with a motorhead umlaut on it yeah. kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, certainly the anarchy. The anarchy. <laughs> it might be that anarchy symbol that, that is the kind of art that that I do. But it's but it's to do with the cathartic um, processing of of my misery. You're right. It is. It is. It certainly inspired me. I don't know if it'll be of any help to anyone else. Um, I mean, thus far, it's tended to astound and confuse people. But, but that's art in itself, isn't it? That's yeah, really well, sure. I don't, I, you know, maybe maybe if I create enough of it with enough consistency, mm. it'll, it'll take on a, 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 a different energy how long have you been sober um well um you know i'm not i i have stopped counting I've, I've 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 stopped um drinking alcohol i have alcohol free lager or even if it's even if it's got point something of a percentage in it I, i'm mm. not i'm not a fascist about it mm. um and i've stopped most other drugs but then you know, sugar, flour. It's all the same. It's going to kill... It's, that, that'll kill me. That'll kill me as well. And um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not clean or sober in mm. a lot of areas of my life. It's, it's, it's ongoing. Mm. And um, it's, um, it's, it's being humbled by that, which is really important. That You know, it's... Uh, you know, the more you clean something, the more those fucking little specks that you leave behind mm -hmm. sort of annoy they're, you. Yeah, they're a lot more prevalent. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there any moments in your career, definably, that was... Because you're, you're talking about mm. a, a recovery yeah, period. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything definable that you can say to yourself, actually, yeah, I was really having a hard time during that project for that reason, that yeah. I was on a come down trying to get off, you know... Well, declucking or whatever. Yeah, well, the first 35 years of my life was spent running away from um, my, my misery. And um, then, I, then my second son came along just when I thought I was going to peg it at 35. Suddenly I, I had a, a child to look after. And, and that, was, that was a very defining moment where I realised it was... It was time to change my lifestyle if I wanted another thirty-five years, mm. and um, so yeah, that was that. That was probably the most defining moment of my life. I can remember rolling a joint on a Saturday morning and my two-year-old crawling across the floor in front of morning television, and my wife sleeping off the Friday night mm. that we'd had, and I w I was wishing that I was in bed sleeping it off, mm. but I had. The baby to look after and that was it that was uh that was that it was time to uh get some help and um change my lifestyle a bit and uh, i've got no regrets for any of it all of uh, all of it before or after that moment so you all. went into rehab that, that was a thing no i didn't i didn't go into rehab i did it with uh, the help of um the 12 step program mm -hmm. and um and uh yeah fellow fellow addicts recovering nutcases and um yeah i've 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 had a very fulfilling second innings thus far does it feel more clearer or in the second half yeah it's uh -huh. yeah there's there's a lot more clarity to the confusion i mean the confusion's <laughs> still there but i'm very clear about it <laughs> yeah um you know it's it's uh, it's uncertainty and it's embracing it and it's working with the energy of it and it's like you know being able to um, know that we're, you know, that I'm just part of this universal thing called life, mm. and um, you know, I, I was I was thinking the other day about gravity, and um, as one does, of course, yeah, mm. as you're sitting down doing nothing, yeah. your bum, you, you get this sensation of your bum on the seat. And it's this thing that Newton discovered called gravity, and he discovered to, he, he decided to call it gravity. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a fucking <laughs> what word that? for yeah. it! Like grave, like you're gonna die, yeah. 
or grave like you're really serious. <laughs> but this thing of like one mass being attracted to another mass causes my bum to feel what it feels on the seat. Uh, it's called gravity. And um You thought this sober? This yeah. Is, you see what I'm saying? There's a uh, Dalai Lama is an exclusive on the podcast. This most definitely is an exclusive uh, on the podcast. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I remember tripping and I never used to like acid that much. And the bit that really put me off was when I started to melt into things. Mm, I've and heard about this. Yeah. yeah, when you start melting into shit, then that's really, <laughs> that's like, fuck, that's a bad trip. And um, But I have to say, though, like, you're from the fashion world. I mean, if you're not watching and listening, I'm rocking my Judy Blame outfit exclusively for the, the man here. Because, you know, we're talking about levels of beast... Beastness, you know, Judy, you know, he he was the last of the party. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and and fashion was all about that. It must have been, you know, to 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 melt in your seat in any given week is for, was probably the order of the day, wasn't it? It's, yeah, well, it, it it had its time, but um, and uh, I shared some of those times with Judy. But even with Judy, there came a time when he had to stop drinking, and. Um, mm. And, you know, he got another, he, he should have died. And amazingly, he got another eight years of his it's life. Incredible, wasn't and, it? And it was a really amazing eight years that actually mm. saw him, you know, get, get an exhibition at the ICA and saw him properly recognized around the world. That was an amazing. And, you know, with it, yeah, without actually having reached a rock bottom where he nearly fucking died, mm. I don't know if that, if that would have ever happened. We were very lucky to. I mean, yeah. rest in peace. I mean, he's missed, man. Yeah. Which is... Yeah. Well, my first book's about my relationship with him and a guy called Christopher Nemeth. Oh, who was a, legend, yeah. a close friend of his. That's right. And ours. So that's what my first strand's about. Watch this space. <laughs> Another couple of years should see it through. Wow. <laughs> <gasps> oh, I bet there's some stories in that. There are a few, yeah. It's, um, it's heavy. Christopher Nemeth as well, what a yeah. oh, legend. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. The Penny and the Post Sack, it's going to be called. Judy being the Penny and Chris being the Post Sack. Absolutely. Wicked. Watch out for that. <laughs> favourite uh, favorite, um, publication to work for? We're going uh, to go into the more direct questions now. Um, favourite publication? Um, well... I, I, most of my work's been for ID magazine. I've never... Um, I don't think I've ever really taken my career that seriously. Um, that's, I don't think I've ever taken my career seriously enough. Um, my favourite publication that I haven't worked for is a magazine called Lilliput. Lilliput? Yeah. I shall find out. I shall make Lilliput endeavors. Lilliput was a small, small pocket-sized magazine of the 50s. And um, it used to have rather humorous diptychs in it that compared current political figures like Hitler to a baboon or stuff like that. Quite private eye almost. Yeah, it was really, it was really groundbreaking. And then I was involved with a magazine called The Fred Magazine. That was a pretty good magazine. That rings bells. Huh? And um, that was pocket size. That was A5. And um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't really. You know, I still, I still dream of, of like doing editorials for Vogue and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if I'm going to live long enough to find Why the time to do that. Well, recently I've been actually offered, I think it's more to do with my sons that I've been offered to do stories for Italian Vogue, but quite often they've wanted my sons to do them with me. And um, my sons have told me that I shouldn't do them. So I haven't. So I've been asked at last uh -huh. to do them. Uh, I've actually been told to say no to them, which is quite interesting. You would have thought it would have been full cycle. It would have just, you know, the nurturing of your sons and all of a sudden the reward. Yeah, well, there know, is the reward. Not only a decent pension fund, but also, you know... You there, know there, there, 
there was the reward, but it was but it was beyond my wildest dreams to that to be asked and then to say no. That's actually yeah yeah. Isn't that ironic? A level yeah. of irony there, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So you you never know. Yeah, it's a very strange world out there. I bet in your your career and life thus far, obviously we've got the book and God knows how much more in the future. But you must have seen a lot of that where you're yeah, you're. It's like a it's like a conveyor belt of opportunities and things. A game of chess where the you know the the game is the same but the players change kind of thing. Yeah, well, I, the chess isn't a very good analogy for me because I'm not very good at. I'm, I quite like losing games, so you don't want to play a game with someone who enjoys <laughs> losing. Techers, isn't it? It's, like, it's like really boring. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not very good at that, but. Um, is that just lack of patience again? Is that just? Uh... Yeah, I think it is. It's, <laughs> it's just, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not that interested. But you said something else then. I've yeah, just in terms of the, the way the world works within a career span, it's it's mad how things raise their head out of nowhere. And you're like, oh, I didn't expect that one coming. You must yeah. have loads of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't expect that one. I didn't expect to land up teaching. That was for sure. Mm. Um, I didn't expect to be around anymore. Um, Did you honestly think you weren't going to be around anymore? Yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah, my mum died from addiction quite young. Um, I, I, you know, I'd stayed up nights partying, so I'd, I, I thought I'd lived twice as far, so I had half as long. Mm. Um, yeah, no, I kind of lost the track of what I was going to say. Live fast, die old. I think that's what happens, isn't it? All this, you know, it's not so rock star when you... Well, you guess you, you become it, don't you? You become the thing that you set out to do, like most creatives, like you... Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. I think I've... Um, I guess why the I'm teaching thing's crazy, it. isn't it? I guess why the teaching thing is like quite bonkers. To yeah, because it happened. It was what I was doing with my production company mm -hmm. and just losing lots of money at it. I landed up getting paid for doing it, which was quite amazing. Because you're teaching the whole time, every time you're managing a, a, a project, aren't you? Yeah. Favourite yeah. film? Um, of yourself? Favourite film? Yeah. Um, I quite liked A Man and a Woman. Okay. Um, which was... I was led to believe that it was shot on the back of a Dunlop advert. And it's about this love story... And it has a lot of uh, samba in it, and um, Lovely. it's a French film. It's got a lot of it's. It, I think it introduced my mum to South American music, Yobim and Getz and Gilberto and all of those those lot. And um, I like the idea of it being shot on the back of a Dunlop commercial, <laughs> and <laughs> that the shot at the end of the film. What happens is, is that the the two lovers, he leaves, they they part their ways in the south of France and she gets on a train back to Paris. This, can't, this doesn't seem true to me, <laughs> talking about it now. But that he gets in his car and he drives back to Paris in the car and he gets there, oh no, um, I don't know. He seems to get there in his car before her train gets there, which has got to be impossible. That was, this rings bells now. Anyway, he uh. gets to the station. Somehow he gets to the station, whether it's in his car for real or not, or whether he gets on a plane and gets a plane up there, and he meets her off the train. And she's not... She's actually getting a so low budget that she's getting on the train for real and actually going to Paris. And she that's the end, that's the last shot of the film. It's the end of filming. But then what happens is that, unbeknownst to her, he lands up being in Paris with a film crew and she gets off the train and there he is. That's amazing. And <laughs> the, the expression on her face is one of true yeah, surprise yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. to see the film crew and this bloke and the fact that they that they continue their I love together. I fucking love that. And um, there were there was there was a lot of ad lib sort of stuff in the film, and it had kids involved in it as well. And um, 
yeah, had some pretty good racing scenes in it as well. Wow. Uh, as a love story, and it had the, that most wonderful music in it. French have a real way of, like, making the most... Making the most out of out of the ingredients they have, don't they? Like, yeah. you know, this could be... I- irreversible. Do you remember that French film? Was it French? I'm almost certain. Yeah. Where ev- the whole movie, it was actually a simple story, but it was all in reverse. Yeah. Just real clever use yeah. of ingredients in, in They They things. seem to be more modest about... Well, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't think modest is the way that you sort of describe <laughs> French people. Big up the Parisian generally. crew watching. <laughs> um, but um, they're, they're so fucking arrogant about the Impressionists and mm. art mm. that I find that really a tricky bit of, of French people. The fact that the Impressionists were so fucking good and... Mm. And then, 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 of course, the Surrealists and everything that came after that, another yeah. fucking load of Frenchies. And but then um, we have Mr. Bean. So, ah, right. And then we trump the... <laughs> <laughs> you know, but apart from their snobbery, they don't seem to be that... They don't seem to be as snobby about their filmmaking mm. as, as they are about their art heritage. Mm. So I think that's a relief. And there was certainly... You know, in this, in that film, you know what I mean, fam, there, there, there's, there's no arrogance in there at all. It's a very, very lovely, modest film that is culturally really enriching, both from the way it was filmed and just the, the music for me was really a great, a great thing to be introduced to that. Talk to me about London culture. Talk to me about, like, the 80s Soho, this era. Yeah, well... Um, I don't know. I didn't get into the new romantic thing. I liked the the sort of, I liked the Rasta punk connection. Mm-hmm. I I was, I was I was into reggae and Sky and Calypso before then, and um, I loved all of that. And then I just, I sort of got funked out and jazz, and. Yeah, definitely missed out on the new romantic electro thing. Though I got back into the new the the electro thing mm. and stuff since then. But you know, the problem with the eighties is it had the new romantics in it, and um, I just didn't relate to that just that didn't much at all. But um, you know, I was friendly enough with everyone involved in it, but just from a musical point of view, it didn't didn't really rock my boat. Um, and since then, I'm just an old man who listens to the old stuff and not. What's, what's the old going stuff for you? Now. What's the old stuff? Well, for it's you? just reggae and a bit mm. of funk, jazz, and. But sometimes nostalgia on a thing like, especially like eighty synth and new romantics and whatnot, can take a hold of you. Where actually, you know, in a weird way, looking at music now, you can kind of justify your taste towards it a bit more. When you were years younger, you didn't yeah. want a piece of it. Yeah. Isn't that weird how yeah. nostalgia works? Yeah, it works like that, yeah. yeah. But it's still reggae, reggae and funk and jazz. and. Yeah, I don't know, I just... I mean, world music, you know, it's just like... Mm. Variety, variety provides real solutions, that's one of the laws of information theory so you know i like i like to mix it up i love that you just said that that's just blown my mind i yeah. love it yeah you full of these anecdotes it's not the, it's not the, it's not the conversation i was expecting right. it's a very you you, you deep thinker Oof. i i i used to they used to take the piss out of me at school by um by uh when i used to pass in the corridor they used to go heavy because <laughs> I used to talk, I used to talk like even as a thirteen and fourteen year old about psychotherapy and stuff like that, and you know they, I used to get the piss taken out of me all the time. Anyway, now I'm deeply overweight, and also the last T-shirt that came out, which was part of this label that Dave and I did with um, with. Uh, Michael Kaufman from Gimme Five Ooh, was this yeah. available nowhere homage. It to Judy Blame. Yeah. It's this, one of the first portraits that I took of Judy and somehow or other this typography of the word heavy 
landed up above the Polaroid of this of this portrait of him on a on a on a blue breeze block on a blue ventilation block that goes into a building well anyway i've landed up making a t-shirt of it and now i've got a t-shirt with judy's <laughs> face on it that says heavy <laughs> so yeah i am i am quite a deep thinker and it's i don't know if it's it's just yeah it's just how i think i don't we've all got to avoid reality in some way and i do it by just being deep about mm. stuff and then I got this deep voice <laughs> to go with, it. which is so and, true to the to the audibles out there. And and I'm overweight as well, so now I've got the complete package. And then and my latest interest is in gravity, <laughs> just as <laughs> like the icing on the cake. It's all to play for over it. Uh, yeah, uh, um, but you're. I, I can't imagine uh, there there isn't any ego in that. Like you seem to me like you. You're aware of your your own head. Well, it took me You're not forcing it on people. I don't know what do you mean by ego. You're not forcing. You know, some people know, or at least like to think they know too much as a deep thinker, and then sometimes it can be really quite intense. And before you know it, they're trying to insist on you, yeah, ideals, yes, and stuff. You you don't come across like that. No. At all. Well, I just I I try to just be who I am and. Um, encourage other people to be who they are i suppose and um uh but ego uh, i think it's a very mixed know, up word to be fair it's a very mixed up word but i've i've had to start defining words as i've got older mm. so for me ego is something th that um is where you operate from a place of fear mm -hmm. and so you know, in the example that you gave, you want other people to be like you because then you're not alone. Then you're not alone. Mm. But um, if if you're all right with um, being different and that we're all different, and in that we're all together mm. because we're all different. Mm. So in that we're all the same because mm -hmm. we're all different. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of it gets out. You know, it brings us all together without us having to be all the same. Yeah. It brings us all together because we're all different. It brings us all together because, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, other things like we all get a bit frightened. Mm. So, you know, I've got an ego where I want to bring us all together so that we're all the same, yeah. but at the same time being all different. I sort of try and, try and accommodate it all. And in an information technology, it's really easy for conspiracy theorists and people that uh, may consciously have a bit of an agenda. But the truth is, like you say, it's fear that they come to these conclusions to make themselves feel settled. Mm. And and what you're saying is celebrate the complete opposite, celebrate yeah. the fact that everything's different. And and rightly so, we all have different opinions and whatnot. Yeah. And that's the way it should be. Yeah. Because that's yeah. how you have... I. That's how you make correct decisions that's and, right that's oh. how that's real problem solving yeah. rather than an imposed solution yeah. on an imposed problem yeah it's just like well so so what well i tell you so what some of them pick up a lot of impetus and fucking cause a lot of damage yeah which is very sad but hey ho mm. you know it's not all fucking sunny days and actually, when it does get to be all sunny days, then we've got that to worry about. And then they're back in misery again. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a very it's British like, problem. my son, bring yeah. on the rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This isn't right. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's fucking spring already. Yeah. What's that? It is a British problem, isn't it? I think this is yeah. very much a British topic, to be yeah. fair. It's been a pleasure having you on, man. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, and I'll see you around. Yes. We're local. Yeah, absolutely. Great. We'll go for an orange juice or something. Yeah. All of those things. fake Guinnesses. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mark LeBon inside the house. Thank you very much, sir. Killer Keller podcast, out like in was out of fashion. You stay lucky now. Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't. All right. Be good. Peace. <laughs>